Hello, everybody, and even if you don't have a body, although you probably should have a body. I'm Layman Pascal, and this is the Integral Stage, and as you probably know, I edited the Metamodern Anthology for Perspectiva Press. I lead the Metamodern Spirituality Retreats hosted by Brendan Graham Dempsey, and I'm a strong advocate for the ways in which integral thinking and metamodernity complement each other in their depths. So I'm better than most folks at saying stuff that seems legit metamodern, but I don't know if I'm as good as our guest today. Because Jermaine Marvel, who communicates via the lens of Black metamodernism, strikes me as having some of the best and most pertinent clarifications of metamodernity on the market today. He's a Marvel, and I'm pleased to have him here. Hey, man. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> Thanks for that introduction. Very, very generous of you. Thank you. <laughs> I've, I've really been enjoying the articles. Um, but this is what I thought. To start with, mm -hmm. who are the ancestors of this conversation we should express gratitude to? And who might be the descendants of this conversation we should have some wishes for. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, firstly, for reading my articles. Um, I can tell you've read them from the opening. I see this as a traditional Yoruba opening to give thanks and to set intentions. So I guess everybody who has worked on metamodernism, this is going to be a very loose one, but thank you to everyone who's worked on metamodernism, and especially the people in the Black metamodernism group, because uh, they've contributed a lot to what you can see, in fact, um, a very crucial piece of it would never have existed without that group. So thank you to everyone in the group. And I'm going to do a very special dedication. I want to dedicate this to uh, the community. And this is just to the, any communities who are fomenting, but most specifically to ones I, I have in mind and they know who they are, to keep doing what you're doing in the face of the adversity and the obstacles. And I know we're going to make it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> thank you for that. I'm Canadian, so I have a very untrained ear for regions of England. I can tell British, but beyond that, I don't know. What? Uh, where'd you grow up? Where's your accent? Uh, so my accent's a bit of a medley. I grew up, I spent 10 years in London from my birth, and then I moved to Gloucester, uh, which is near Wales. It's just outside Cheltenham, Bristol. Um, it's more countryside for those who need to know. So I've got, I've got some of the countryside accent, but I've also got a bit of a ling the lingo from London as well. So what I'll try to do, though, is I'll try to slow down because I speak quite fast and hopefully we'll be able to translate. <laughs> <laughs> um, before I get to kind of the first question I have in mind, I wanted to say that I really like that you've got people like Brent Cooper and Jill Nephew got their ideas folded into your work because... You know, uh, I appreciate your ability to absorb perspectives from people with strong ideas and strong personalities, because those characters, they really have something to contribute. And often, for some reason, people find them off-putting or aren't sure how to process them. So I appreciate the richness of that. Maybe we start with, well, let's talk about blackness in Black metamodernism, because it's it's not just skin pigmentation, ethnic politics, and having more recent African heritage than the other humans, but it's also not not those things. So talk to me about how you balance the, the racial historical geographic conversation with the more abstract notion of standing against uh, monological, lightness-obsessed, ascensionist, left-brain, lopsided, young, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So um, something that has really fermented and cemented my opinions on this is uh, this book, uh, Beyond Black or White, by uh, the Vernon J. Dixon and Baddy Foster. Now, Vernon J. Dixon is the guy, and um, I believe it's Jen Pierre who led me on to him. And uh, so for me to explain what blackness is to me, I have to explain how I think about it and what that logic is. And the logic I use is called diunital logic. Uh, it means both and. It's an opposing structure could be either or logic. So for me, personally, I'm not black and I am black. My skin's not black, um, but I am black because that's what I'm called in the society. In addition to that, I'm not white and I am white. My skin's not white. No one calls me white. I probably do have some white ancestors, but that's not what, really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the cultural, the cultural Westernness, because essentially we associate whiteness with Westernness, even if we don't want to say that. So yeah, but then also, or I should say, and on top of that, blackness for me represents the archetype, um, or represents a archetype, um, a lot like young shadow, also a lot like nothingness, and 
moving on to a wider maybe conversation, but light supremacy in a light supremacy term, for instance, the Europe, the sorry, the American flag, white symbolizes purity. And so the negated then is blackness would symbolize impurity. And so it's living that and embodying that and knowing that, you know, that's not really just what I am. And it's not that knowing other people aren't that. I'm breathing that through into a lived experience of <laughs> managing these things which are completely separate, seem completely separate, but actually can be held in a whole. And that is diunitality or diunitalism. Who is Vernon Dixon? Mm. Name that comes up a lot in circles I travel in. Uh, what makes him so awesome? And uh, what do you, uh, how, how did you encounter him? And what do you draw out of his work? So uh, as far as I know, Vernon J. Dixon was a professor, M, sorry, professor and doctor of economics, as far as I know. His work that I, that I came across him, I believe it's through Jem Peer, Jem Peer Rich. Um, they've got a group on Facebook as well. And they led me to Diunital Living, which is another group on Facebook um, run by Jerry Katz, who has done a very handy PDF on Diunital Living. I recommend that as just a basis. It's uh, far easier to read than any of my stuff because my stuff has slowly become more academic. Why is he so amazing? I'm going to give my point of view. In my point of view, he is a metamodernist, in my point of view. Um, in my point of view, he grounded this the the cultural logic of metamodernism identified in African-Americans and wider. And um, <sighs> there's a gentleman, uh, Zavade, I believe his name is, I, can't, I, I rarely talk about this with people, so I might get names wrong, forgive me. Um, Zavade, you can um, read it in my uh, script. And he said that there was a, no, sorry, it was Borgman. Borgman noticed that there was going to be a bifurcation, a split in post-modernity Something new was coming and it could either go to hypermodernity or metamodernity. It went to hypermodernity, in my opinion, and that is because Vernon J. Dixon and all the people he worked with, Edwin J. Nichols, they, they were ignored, basically, um, uh, occulted, hidden, uh, because they were coming from the perspective of blackness. Um, so, yeah, his, his work for me is pivotal to everything. Yeah, yeah. Right. So we could have a... Uh a different and richer growth beyond modernity if we'd actually been able to absorb ideas and perspectives from a, a wider swath of thinkers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. uh, diunital is a, it's a great word to have in the mix. It seems to uh, be very strongly related to the both and concept, which is at the heart of Ken Wilber's work. Mm -hmm. uh, and he spoke a lot about sort of what he called vision logic, right? A form of cognition in which we would operate with structures that had this both and uh, mm. element to it. But that phrasing vision logic is particularly Ken Wilberish. He's very optically focused. It's the eye of this and the eye of that and being the witness. It seems to me that it might be better to think about it not as vision logic, but as sort of affective logical or something like that to bring feeling in. And I know this is central to your work and maybe you can tell us why you associate metamodernism so much with emotional intelligence. Mm. At his heart, undeniably, um, this is where integral and metamodernism come in, both and or diunital thinking is at its heart. So for me and for uh, people like Wade Nobles, um, and several other, I can't remember, I can't pronounce the name, Damascus, I believe, I, I, I mentioned her in my first article. When you take both and to our concepts of logic and uh, what is valued, we see, we set, we set logic up with the negation of emotion. And so Dionetal automatically we just think, okay, why can't we bring those together? Why can't those two things come together? And the reason why this is necessary is because uh, logic can only take us so far. This is, this is uh, my belief. I believe we've done really well with logic and it's got us to amazing, amazing places, but logic can only take us so far, um, especially if we're ignoring emotion because that is simply a bypass. Now this can, you know, this can come across as to some thinkers, for example, Descartes, Descartes said, I think therefore I am. Um, what people like, Edwin Nichols would say is that I think therefore I am is a measure object is a man to object relationship. So I think is the cognition and therefore I am 
I become the object. And I measure that object as something separate to myself. The African way, on the other hand, would be seen as more of an effective emotional. So what they would do is they would, I would see, I would be affected by something, something would impact me, I have a feeling about that. Then I then think about that feeling and have, make a narrative for that feeling. And then I know what the object is and I, I say I am. So this is whole chain. And this is a really interesting thing because that chain is until now been separated, even in the literature, it has been separated, even in um, the literature um, in the book has been separated. But when you put them together, you can see a fuller picture, um, for example, of art, of how art can art is not greater than the sum of its whole. That feeling that we get from art is not because it's greater than the sum of its parts, you know, it's because it's encompassing all of the experiences, it's encompassing the effect of the circumstance, it's encompassing the feeling it gives you then it's making a narrative and it's, and it's giving all of that and, and it's making you question and it's inviting you into all of the experiences whilst also providing a sense of mystery because we don't really know what the artist exactly went through. So, yeah, I hope that answered your question. I'm not sure. <laughs> I get an image of, of a convergence between intellectual and emotional intelligence. So this intellectual intelligence, to get to the both and place, it's got to go through a lot of growth. It's got to develop a lot of nuance. It helps if a person has some sort of metacognitive ability to reflect on their thinking as they're going. And it arrives in this place where you can say yes to things that are seemingly opposite and treat that as a reliable tool of sense making and not as a, a weird <laughs> end of logic. So that's the trajectory from the logical side. When the emotional intelligence converges there with the both and thinking, I guess the question is, what does it take emotion? What does it have to do to get there? Like, how do we grow in emotional intelligence in a way that's complementary to the intellectual intelligence to get to a place where they can merge together more seamlessly? How can we get there? So I think... How do you get smarter emotionally, Jermaine? <laughs> I think it's about... Two things, it's told twofold. One's have been about aware of what we're negating, aware of what I'm negating within me and holding space for that and the unknown of what that is within all the tensions, you know? Um, meditation is really good for that, contemplation is good for that. Second thing is it does lead us to the spiritual, um, in my opinion, uh, and also in a Yoruba opinion. Um, Yoruba is a culture from, Nigeria, and they have this uh, philosophy called Ifa. In Ifa, they have this concept called Ori. Ori, tra literal translation is head, but it also is soul. And it's also the calabash that unites the head and the heart. So for me, I see that as holding space, the calabash is the holding the space, the head is the logic and the heart is the emotion. So when we hold the space for that in center and say, okay, these, my emotions are logical, and my logic does have a foundation of emotion in it. When I accept those both things to be true and I hold space in the center for a sense of mystery, um, yeah, for me, for me, that's the way that I, I feel. I've been able to, I've been able to do that. I, I, I could 100% do better, uh, especially as a man, I think um, I've been conditioned to kind of ignore certain things so it can be a bit more difficult, you know? Um, yeah. But there's this concept of empty perceptual space, which is associated with Western worldview, which allows this space between me as human and me as object. And it's very useful, but it needs to be investigated. Um, for instance, nihilism, this is where nihilism went wrong. It didn't investigate what nothing is. It just, you know, nothing is nothing. Um, so when we, yeah, so I guess the third thing is, as well, is the capacity to hold space for mystery as well um, and to investigate nothingness and mystery and still be fine with not knowing as well at the same time. Um, yeah. So what I'm hearing is um, going back and forth between thinking and feeling all the time, making sure that one stays present with an as feeling under conditions that might otherwise be mysterious, impossible, full of cognitive dissonance, things like that. Mm -hmm. But also, like you mentioned, the Yoruba, having a, a 
cultural ethos in which it's suggested um, that we ought to be bringing feeling along with thinking. Right? And that's one of, I think, one of the interesting possibilities for metamodernism is the potential that it could grow into a, a simultaneously cognitive and affective cultural experience, maybe at the planetary stage. I agree. And the, the cognitive dissonance that you mentioned is really important because that is, that is tension. For me, bodily, that is, what ten, that is tension. Um, let's bring it, let's, let's bring it to, the, to Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill is, you know, he's racist, but he also saved England. So I'm British or English. And so I'm taught to, you know, revere this man. And at the same time, I, I have to know that, well, he said, he, he was reported to say, keep Britain white is a good slogan for his party, the Conservative Party. So I, I wouldn't be here if that had been the case. At the same time, I wouldn't be here if he wasn't here. And so I have to kind of accept that both of these things are true and have respect for the man and yet not revere and ignore this other side of him. And um, before I can, as you said, I'll be going back and forth between, oh, he's a good man and you know he's not a good man. And that's what that's the source of tension. For me, that's the source of tension. It's the swimming, swinging between opposites. Once I center that tension and say, okay, it's okay to be with that tension and see where it goes, I can be to be with that friction and see what traction we can get from it, then that offers opportunities. Um, Let's run through some culture codes and how they relate to individualism. What is what is the essence of the modern? And what is the modern individual? The essence of the modern could probably be put into the idea that traditionalism needs to be overcome in some way. Yeah, sorry, I'm actually putting a blank here, you know. <laughs> yeah, and the reason why I'm putting a blank is because there's so many different perspectives on uh, what it could be. Um, for instance, uh, modernism could be seen as a positive project building something after uh, the failures of traditionalism, for example, and postmodernism then could be seen as a negative project. Um, yeah, no, I'm actually drawing a blank. Maybe right. I'm <laughs> Sorry. Well, so maybe you could give us, uh, yeah, and it's all, it's all in the writings, folks. It's very, very yeah. Yeah. It's right. it's right. I actually, I actually wrote that. I, I actually wrote all this stuff so I could come here and like have, have a, you know, teach myself and then I'll, I'll have it all in my head. But unfortunately, I've written like 40,000 words over the past month <laughs> or and a half. And yeah. I'm what's like, your uh, what's <laughs> the sense of the difference between the postmodern and the hypermodern? For me, the hypermodern is the, the going back and forth between modern and postmodern tenets. So if we say modernism is construction and postmodernism is deconstruction, then it would be say, okay, I'm going to try and construct, and then I'm not actually going to deconstruct what I've done, and okay, I'm going to try and construct. Um, and it's this swinging back and forth. It's this oscillation for me. It's an oscillation of ever degree, um, ever intensifying speeds between postmodern ways of thinking and metamodern ways of thinking. <laughs> the, the, the trouble is, is that it's not just a modern or a postmodern thing. Um, yeah. Sorry, I think I'm actually hungry and I'm trying not to eat and on screen. It's probably very annoying. Um, <laughs> also, I'm, I'll be real, I'm actually being really formal and I did actually have the intention to come on and be a bit more informal because that's where I'm more comfortable. At the same time, it's difficult for me to do that because me being informal and uncomfortable is also in some circles seen as unprofessional and uh, not logical enough, um, not rigorous thinking enough. Yeah. Well, we've, to recap, we've, sorry. Got, we've got rigorous thinking in the writing. <laughs> Topics we're discussing are pretty abstract. Uh, so I think, you know, as casual as you want to get or somewhere in between. Like, what would it look like if you went 20% more casual? Uh, yeah, I agree. And in doing so, and even thinking about it, it brings me to really um, the whole point of like modernism and to go back to the question. And 
I think we've got a sense of modernism as being a Western, completely Western construct and something that just happens in the West. And this is kind of what Moyo Okadeji says is what we're trying to get out of with metamodernism is that we're trying to de, yes, decenter the West. The West doesn't need to be in the center. It's not that we're not replacing anything else in the center. We're actually holding space in the center for all the conflicts between the West and the East and the South, which hardly ever gets mentioned. So, yeah, so, but then really, I like to look at modernization and modernization as a process and just a process of, of uh, bringing things up to date, bringing things to the state of the art, as opposed to, so modernity for me would be a, a time of this type of process and post-modernity for me would be a time of the process of trying to break that down and, so, and say, okay, well, we've, you know, we've done terrible things with this project now. And we've had world wars and nuclear bombs and we've killed millions of people and we've got racism that we can't sort out. Um, so what can we do? Yeah, so, yeah, so another way to talk about modernism could be to talk about it in the game A and game B ways, in that game A is, a mod, is the modernism project. It's not that game, but then postmodernism is also the game A project. What this leads us to is to see that actually postmodernism is simply modernism reacting to itself and applying its own ways of thinking to itself, a kind of metacognition, but it didn't go, it, it rarely goes far enough. It rarely goes far enough in that applying it to itself because the place that modernism has done or postmodernism, because really they're the same thing, the, the modernization process would be for me, decolonialism and post the thoughts of post-colonialism. Although they are also incomplete projects, they were, sim they were pointing to the actual problem at the heart of the metamodern, at the heart of the modernist project, which is, you know, thinking that the West is best and, and, and setting up a system of what Wade Noble calls a cut conceptual incarceration, where because the West is best and our systems are thought are the best, we determine how you can think. And if you're not thinking like this, it's not valued. And because there are different ways of thinking, yeah, it just means that a lot gets left out. So you, it would be, it would be, uh, you could say that modernism is a, a colonial project as well. But then we would need to define what col colonialism is. And I, I think it's wider and looser than uh, the names that it's given. Um, yeah. I think it's really useful to have a word like hypermodern in play. There's a thing in Gebser's studies that there's this notion of the deficient rational. Uh, I think we could think of hypermodern as the deficient transrational, right? Instead of actually moving beyond the modernist project, it's like you say, oscillating. It's some kind of weird blend of, of late modern self-critical values done in a modern way and the old fashioned linear progress modernist project. And Seems like we might even call that progressive. It gets called progressive, but really it's a kind of cul-de-sac that's holding us in place. And one of the interesting things to me about that cul-de-sac is how it keeps us in place by retroactively imagining a certain kind of a history. Uh, Graeber and Wengrau's um, Dawn of Everything book kind of addressed that question. But what, what's your sense of like, how is... How is colonialism applied to our idea of the past in order to trap us in the particular type of present that we're in? This is, yeah, I guess we're getting back into emotion again. Okay, I'm situating myself fully Western, uh, yeah. trying to put myself in that perspective. Um, uh, uh, yeah. And uh, very proud of what we've done, you know, of my history, of what we've done, what we've achieved in the West, um, especially in the conditions of uh, the Northern Hemisphere compared to the Southern Hemisphere. Very difficult to get stuff done and thrive and survive. So very proud. But if I don't have an ability to look at my past and my mistakes and see that I may have been wrong without bypassing it and without going to the complete opposite extreme, then I won't be able to look at my own memories of the past in the same way. 
history is history is just like the memories of a culture, right? So memories of a group of people. So you you can kind of look at it like as an individual, you know. I I am the West. I have the memory of what I've done in the past. Didn't turn out great. I've done some terrible things. I know that now. I can't quite admit that to myself or to my children. Because if I admit that to myself or to my children, I will see myself as something bad. And I have this either or thinking, so I can't be eat, I can't be bad. Because you know, I'm good. I'm good. Look at what I've done. I do good things. And I can't let my children know I've done bad things because then they just won't listen to me. That's the thought. It's an old school style of parenting, you know, um, an old school style of education um, where the teacher is always right. And it's this, it's this kind of mentality which is enforced by the evil or thinking, the dichotomous thinking, which is set up by the empty perceptual space of being in an environment which is terrible. Like it's, it's, it's hard. The Eurasian steppes, um, the Ice Age, the Ice Age hadn't ended when, when we had first moved into that area. The lack of flora and fauna compared to, to Africa, it, essentially desert. Um, you've got dromedaries that go all the way up to like um, what was the former Soviet Union, you know, um, that's, that's, they, they exist in desert, you know, and this is huge swathes of land. So in order for me to face starvation, this emptiness in my stomach, I have to kind of create a space from between that emptiness and myself to carry on in order to leave someone I love behind because they can't move. And if we stay, we're going to freeze to death. I have to set up an empty space. Um, I have to adapt to that, to, to, to survive in that environment. And so that's like, okay, I have to make strict decisions. And yeah, that brings up the evil or thinking, you know, it's either I stay here and help this person or I die. You know, there's no both about this. Um, yeah. It's interesting to think about either or thinking emerging, right? Like um, without endorsing Graham Hancock, it seems to be a real value in trying to feel and imagine the potential sophistication of people in the distant past. And one of the questions that comes up is, well, how, how sophisticated were they? Because we have some very tidy stories about cognitive and social development. They make a lot of sense. They're very clean. But it's quite possible that some of our ancestors were much more sophisticated than we were. And it might even have been fairly normal to have a cultural ethos in the distant past in which either uh, both and thinking was straightforward and either or thinking emerged. Because the normal kind of, let's say, hypermodern story is we're normally primitive and an extension of that primitivism is natural either or thinking. And then only a few special people develop to this magical both and thinking stage. How do, how do you hold the, the story of the uh, improvement of consciousness with these possibilities that our ancestors might have been ahead of us in some seriously important ways. I kind of put it backwards. So you have to forgive me for my tangents, it's just when my brain thinks. So the Aboriginals, the ab in Aboriginal, the ab means before. So when the when the British got over, when we, if I am British, which some people say I'm not, if, when we the British got over there we thought we were the original people on the land and these weren't really people so we called them the aboriginals in game b they call what happened before the modernist project in colonialism they call that and uh, what happened in africa and the communalism that we have in africa they called that proto b so so it's a proto game b it's not you know it's not as good for me and for the theory by and i've never said his name out loud so forgive me i believe it's sheikh anta diop he's uh the Oh, he, he has the University of Dakar named after him. He was a physicist, philosopher, historian, and he came up with the two cradles theorem. And he says that the southern cradle was most likely first, that's Africa, and there was more, and these other, and that became from the, sorry, and that came from the abundant that came from the abundance that was in Africa. And there were worldviews associated with that, uh, family structures that were associated with that. And these family structures had worldviews. And one of the worldviews that has been associated with that is the Bokan thinking. So what, it is, what is being said is that actually, if we're gonna call them primitive, primitive man have this capacity for this very sophisticated both and thinking. 
and then after that something happened. Now, not only does do uh, uh, ancient societies, I won't say primitive, I'll say ancient societies have the capacity for growth and thinking, they also have a very strong uh, feeling of this emotional affect, you know, and so this, this emotional affect, even though it's messy, it's very complex and in order, in order to navigate that, that takes an intelligence, that takes an emotional intelligence, um, that takes a spiritual intelligence. And this is where John, John Effies comes in because there are, in the West at the moment we, and I'm gonna say why, we, well, I've kind of said why already, but we've, we specialize in the analytical intelligence so much so that our AI is basically just, you know, artificial analytical intelligence. Whereas there is a more, there are lots of different types of intelligence. Um, there's an environmental intelligence, or there's the intelligence of hunting, there's athletic intelligence, for instance. So for me, they were as sophisticated. I don't know if, I don't know about more. I don't know about more, perhaps, but I don't, I, I don't know about more. And something happened. So a trauma happened is basically the theory. We went from that abundant mind, abundance environment and abundance mindset and then we had to leave the the Sahara got bigger we we had conflicts in our groups we had to leave and so we moved throughout the rest of the world and and the journey was hard and scarcity mindset set in to different degrees and that what brought that's what brought the either or thinking and a really important thing to notice about either or thinking is that when it comes to friction it doesn't provide degrees of freedom it reduces them to you know you can visualize as either back or forth or either forward now and then right then and you know and whereas the both hand thinking opens up degrees of freedom so you actually have more possibilities so it's almost like because of the trauma that we experienced we had to we we had to apply this logic in order to get through a certain experience and the more that trauma got applied the more it got reinforced and then when it gets to decontextualize it gets embedded in our culture and we don't know why we're doing it but it just becomes part of our culture and accepted yeah, so while something like the two cradles theory can seem very, it can seem deterministic, it's not really. Um, it can seem linear, it's not really. Um, and it can seem simplistic and it's not really. Because when you look at the two cradles theory, you can see two cradles perhaps in, in, inside a nation state, for instance, or in, inside a continent, for instance. So the, um, Africa, it's got the Sahara. So that's, you know, that's an internal uh, uh, scarcity cradle right there inside an abundance cradle. China's massive, you know, the, the north is, I'm, I'm pretty sure the, the, the south is a lot more temperate and humid. And I think the north is uh, a, a bit harsher and sometimes colder as well. So you have, yeah, in, in Britain, you have London in the south and it's, you know, then you have the north and it's a lot more sparse and dense. In the north in Britain, people generally tend to be, uh, tend to be more farmland and they tend to be uh, more open and friendly. And then in the south, they say that you get quiet, you know, a bit damped down. And yeah, I just, it's just interesting because, uh, yeah. And then, sorry, I'm, I remember other things I've written in my paper. Um, what I suggest in my paper is that there's a third cradle. Now we have a third cradle because um, these two cradles in Sheikh and Tadiot's theory meet and where they meet, they create zones of confluence. Um, he said in antiquity, it stretched from Mali to Egypt. I pose that it moved upwards and then became the Mediterranean. Um, that's why you have Greek culture and e Egyptian cultures and they're how they're both, they're, they're a bit both uh, matrilinical in their religion and then Greek is patrilinical in their, you know, so there's a bit of a, there's a bit of both around there. Um, but what I say is that these zones of confluence um, have expanded and become more permanent in the hypermodern age so that now a zone of confluence, not only is it geographically expanded um, because of globalization and the internet, um, but it's also internally expanded um, by, I call that the fourth dimension of space, it, the internal, external, it's internally expanded. So now I am a zone of confluence. You've heard how I'm a zone of confluence and how I've had to move through that zone of confluence with Churchill, for instance. We're all, you know, we're all zones of confluence, really. And this is where we see actually the theory is, it, 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 it's very nuanced and it's complex and it can, it can provide Edwin J. Nichols has got a recent YouTube video and he shows you the different worldviews of the different um, of different nations. And so you can kind of see how, okay, we can understand how there's a human story now from this, but we can also understand how it's not linear and how we have, it accounts for the setbacks, it accounts for movement and it accounts for the dynamics between different nations. 
Yeah. And I think when you add the anthropological discovery of how humans have moved about and and how we have why um why Aboriginals and uh, Polynesian and uh, Native American and Amer and African and and sub and Indigenous Americans have this kind of a shared ethos, and and why it you know why it hasn't been able to. It also explains some seeming um uh, anomalies like um the Inuit people who although they've in a very scarce environment they also have a this this. It's still not this individualism, you know, um, and this, yeah, and I think this is why these cultures can show us not only ways in order in that we could be, but also how we could get back to that. If we kind of trace, you know, what I mean, if we trace, okay, how have they kept this? How have they kept this spirit despite this? And then we can learn from them on a peer-to-peer -peer level, which I think is very important because, yeah, a peer-to-peer -peer level a person-to-person -person relationship that comes from the southern cradle a person-to-person -person relationship is really important I, I value you for being a human being because and in being a human being i know you carry the spirit of ori so i'm, I'm using ori and it can use this in atheist sense as well you know this this feeling because it's a human condition that we're tied to causation we're tied to uh, cause and effect that that a lot of life is suffering because of that um and so and we're all in this together we actually, we know we're, we, we might be at odds, but we're actually all these things together. Um, yeah, so I've talked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I read in one of your things the phrase Afro surrealism. Mm -hmm. And I know nothing about it, but in my early teens, I was pretty heavy into Dali and Breton, Magritte, and the, you know, the Parisian 1920s surrealist cabal. Uh, in some ways, that's still in my thinking about a lot of these things, that in order to get a, a surreality, a more intense reality, you have to combine conscious and unconscious forms of understanding and bring a lot more imagination in. But I'm curious um, what sort of art you look to, whether it's visual art, whether it's music, where do you see, because in metamodernism, there's a there's a strong history of thinking about it partly as an aesthetic and cultural and artistic attitude. What sorts of things really strike you personally as being resonant with metamodernism? So in terms of Afro-surrealism, I would say Atlanta is Afro-surrealist. Um, Afro-surrealist is slightly different in that uh, the Black experience in itself is surreal. We live surreality. Black man's paranoia, for instance. The, the awareness that, you know, this person probably doesn't like me and it probably is something to do with, but it's also probably not to do with that as well. And, and to them, it's not, it might not even be conscious. And I can't, I don't know, but, you know, yeah, Dixon writes about this as well. Um, it's a surreal, it's a surreal circumstance to, to be in, um, to, to know that I am British, but also to question if I am British because of the way that, I and people like me are treated here, um, still are treated here. It's a surreal, it's, it's, yeah, and it's very hard to describe in words if you don't know what it is. I think so. Something like Atlanta is great. Uh, Octavia Butler, um, she might be, people might think she's before Met Modern. I say she's Met Modern. Um, she's got a series that some, she's got an adaptation of a series that's come out um, called Kindred. Then in terms of music as well, a lot of black artists are meta modern, I would say, or have metamodern modern sensibilities just because of this both and structure. Um, one in particular is, <laughs> he's actually my friend, but I'm going to give him a shout out anyway. Um, his name is Doom Cannon um, and he's from uh, London. And his album for me, what he's done with the music, the concepts behind the music, it is all about black. It's it, well for me. It's an instance of black metal modernism. He brought out the album before I coined the term black metal modernism, but we know each other, and so um, and we know each other through uh, music circles. So for me, music is my number one. I like jamming. I like jams. I, I do. I host one. I've got one tonight actually. Um, and we host the jams. Musicians, singers. Uh, we never know what we're gonna do. It's always co-created. And so 
it kind of opens up a space where you've got to listen to each other in a very specific way and you've got to be open to each other and you've got to be supportive of each other. You've got to be prepared to catch somebody and also be prepared to take the risks that you might have to be caught. And again, it's this peer-to-peer relationship. Instead of, uh, this is, some jams can be very clicky and that's because, you know, it's like, what can this, it's a person to object with, what can this person do, you know? But we like to make a peer to peer where it's like, uh, what can you, what can you bring as a human being? Can you bring the energy that can hold the space for us and, and, and be here and be present with us and, and feed the musicians as much as the musicians are feeding you? And for me, this, this transcends things like the full four, you know? Um, yeah, but it also makes you think, who is the musician? You know, and there's this phrase "musicking," uh, which is which says that actually music is made by everybody who's there, and pe- some people who aren't there. You know, the people who made the instruments, the people who the engineers, the people at the venue who run the venue, um, and the audience are a very specific, very special part. And yeah, so that, for me, that's where I find uh, also sorry Jordan Peele. One day I'm going to sit down and I'm going to talk about Jordan Peele properly, but um, Get Out, US, nope. I feel like he's almost saying something, um, speaking to certain ideas of maybe, you know, um, separation and the fact that it's not really needed, just in the titles. Um, Then you have the concepts behind, uh, yeah. Um, but I'll get into that in another time because <laughs> I haven't settled my thoughts on that. But, uh, yeah, so I would say Jordan Peele. About Jordan Peele, I thought. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of agreement about a couple of most you know meta modern. You know, everybody likes Bo Burnham. Everybody liked Everything Everywhere All at Once. That was great. I, I enjoyed it too. But uh, I thought Nope was just as good as Everything Everywhere All at Once uh, in terms of being a meta modern piece of art. It's. Uh, I thought it went considerably farther than his other movies, which are already awesome. But this went into a, that strange terrain uh, that opened up a feeling quality that's really only accessible to people who are emotionally capable of being in that uh, interstitial, super meaningful space. <laughs> I was watching the film and I was wondering, this, this represents something. This being represents something. Whether it's modernity, I don't know but it represents something. It's not just, you know, it's not just making an alien film for me. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, nihilism. I'm, I read a lot of Nietzsche, so I've got a very broad definition of nihilism. <laughs> uh, for me, it's like all the different ways we can nullify ourselves. But then there's a more specific conventional definition of people who go around thinking they believe in nothing. And uh, one of the things I liked in your article on it was it resonated with something I'd read from Henri Bergson in the book Creative Evolution. He has a little section in there about how it's not possible to think nothing. He breaks down a number of different ways. And that's really struck me when I read it years ago. I'm like, okay, so every time nothing comes up in my thinking, I'm actually bullshitting myself. I didn't think nothing. I thought I thought nothing, but I didn't. So what did I think? And some of your reasoning goes in that same sense. If there's if there's no pure absence, everything we call nothing is actually something. What is that something we're pointing to? And we might as well call it meta existence or something like that. It's it's different than and supports all of the things we think exist. And it's not a pure negative, even though it is in some ways a negative relationship to the rest of the things. How's that for a summary? <laughs> and uh, what, what got you interested in nothingness? <laughs> yeah. For a summary, that's great. Um, that's amazing. Um, it's it's uh, this stuff has been ruminating around my head for so long. It's nice to hear it from somewhere else. Like, oh gosh, I can I can, I can go now. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's great to hear. Um, what we brought me to nothingness? Whoa. Uh, I read a book called Reality. I can't remember who it's by now. It was about Parmenides. Uh, and the first written piece. <laughs> Sorry, it's my boxing coach who told me to read this book uh, on reality. Uh, he's also the guy I got the name Marvel from because that was his pseudonym when he would uh, write um, poetry. Um, I hope I can say that, Jerry. And his name's also Jerry, incidentally. Um, so, yeah. Um, and he gave me this book. And it, it talked about Parmenides. It talked about the fact that we look at Greek myth and Greek 
text from a Western worldview. And this worldview means that we miss a lot of the stuff that the Greeks were talking about. Um, one, of the, one, one example of that is the reason why Aristotle died. It's because they had a, they had a memoratum where basically they had said, they censored talking about the 30 tyrants for a certain number of years. And Aristotle talked about the 30 tyrants and he talked about the 30 tyrants in the, the trial as well. And uh, that's why they killed him. He, he, so, but we've never known that because we look at it from a different point of view. We, we don't put all these pieces together. So Parmenides, he, he wrote the first piece of logic. Um, he was in the mystery schools. He was a philosopher. Uh, he became from the line of Zeno. I believe he led to Aristotle and Plato, Plato in the end. And in this poem on nature, he talks about how he goes to meet an unspoke, un, unnamed goddess, which we, is probably Persephone. And she told him that nothing doesn't exist and anything you think of is nothing. And then this led to me thinking about the talks about Socrates and how Socrates said, oh, I know nothing. And that's why he was known to be the wisest. And then, then I was like, and I was also trying to work out, well, how can the universe come from nothing? What is this? this there's this some like opposition here, like nothing, like zero, one, and then, th but then what's the opposite of one? Like it's not two, like this just, just baffled me for a long time. Um, I got nowhere. <laughs> and I then, yeah. Yeah, and then there's also the Buddhist texts that talk about nothing that isn't nothing, you know, and it's just like, okay, so what is this nothing? And yeah, in 2019, I think, uh, after, uh, I'll call it a journey, not the T word, after a journey, I kind of had this realization, okay, oh, the opposite of nothing is something, and the opposite, let's say the opposite of that something is one, what's the opposite of that? That's minus one. And then it kind of just let me think, okay, there's something, yeah. And I still didn't know what it is, because I sound like, I just sound like a madman. So I just wrote this thing. I tried to get all these words out and it was a bit, uh, yeah, it got some traction, but it was a bit like, it wasn't, I made the mistake in that text. It's, the text is called Meta Nothing. I made the mistake of not referring to Meta Nothing in the text. So I was referring to nothing as Meta Nothing, but still calling it nothing. And I think, yeah. Um, it's interesting now looking back because you know now I I mean in the last month or so I've come across this term and empty perceptual space, and so it's like I was looking at myself and saying, "Hey, I've got these two parts of me. What's the difference between them?" And it's almost like I was noticing this empty empty perceptual space, but I didn't have a name for it. I didn't I didn't know it was there. I didn't know it was you know, it had led to so much of differences in thinking. And so I was trying to identify what this thing was. And at the same time, I was having conversations with atheists and theorists in atheists and theorists discussion groups, uh, me feeling like I was neither and both at the same time and not having a word for it. And atheists kept on saying they had no beliefs that atheism wasn't an, an ideology. And it just, it was just clear to me that the, the, the it was an ideology and they were negating something and why and what was this nothing and and how this nothing could link with atheism and metaphe and sorry and sorry and theism um into what became metatheism and then i realized that if you look at god as nothing it links a lot of makes it makes a lot of religious texts make sense it links a lot of them together and it also satisfies, in a way, it doesn't really, um, they're still not happy about it, <laughs> but if it satisfies atheists saying that, you know, God doesn't exist, because, okay, if God doesn't exist, you're saying God is non-existence. Non-existence is nothing. I agree. Non-existence is my God. That's, you know, holding space, for, centering the space for the negated, you know, that's what I come to understand as now. And so I, I just kind of like, I'm tired of arguing all the time. I'm just going to come, I'm just going to come up with this other thing. Um, yeah, and I was also looking at metamods and like both and and so I was like, okay, it makes sense. It makes sense. Let's put them both together. Um, yeah, so that's why I like to talk about nothing a lot. <laughs> it reminds me of an argument I had with an Anglican bishop years ago because I was trying to propose to him that no god is is one of the names of God. Right. And so that he could type, well, no God created the universe and no God governs our destiny. I say, you speak like that, everybody wins. <laughs> but he wasn't having any of it. 
the, the article on Meta Nothing is uh, it's very Hegelian in a lot of ways. Like it's one of the places Hegel starts is trying to hold something and nothing together and, and not being able to and letting them negate each other and force forth this idea of becoming. That's really interesting. But one of the problems with Hegel is you never know how just purely intellectual he's being and how much any of it was grounded in his lived experience. Right? Because when we think about the nothing that isn't exactly nothing, it can be a very abstract idea, or it can be, you were talking about negative perceptual space. It can be grounded in immediate experience that a person is trying to talk about something they're actually encountering. And I think that's a good, uh, the good segue into a discussion about metamodern spirituality that you and I should probably have, which is like, it's got to come back to these transformational subtle dimensions of our lived experience and not just be an idea set. So um, tell, tell people who are listening what your definition roughly of uh, metamodern spirituality is. For me, uh, metamodernism is, uh, is using both and logic, dialectical di logic, to solve complex problems and get through things like paradoxes and cognitive dissonances uh, and come up feeling more whole. For me, spiritual spirituality uh, could be seen as uh, our relationship with existence. If you're atheist, it could be seen as your relationship with God or something greater, if you're theist or something theist related. And then it can also take the Yoruba meaning spirit and soul, which is the head and the heart. Um, so taking these both together, to me, it seems that metamodern spirituality will want to not just synthesize, it's also go beyond this. Bring, so, so it's breaking down this cognitive dissonance between, you know, atheism, theism, breaking down this cognitive dissonance between uh, what is, no, no, I lost the train, sorry. <laughs> Um, well, what, when I was looking at your, uh, I mean, I, I think you were saying something like wherever both and is used to frame practices that lead to a deeper experience of reality, then you have basically um, you have a container or a way of thinking about metamodern spirituality. And so I have a way of thinking about metamodern spirituality, and I was trying to think whether it fits in your container or not. <laughs> and they seem, they seem to me to get along pretty well. But I think about um, metamodern spirituality as being, maybe I'd call it trans agnostic, like, or transcendentally agnostic or something like that. It sort of can affirm but operate outside of the interpretations of itself that is more practice based, that it involves working with paradoxical edges of reality and adjacencies. Mm -hmm. And that as a mode of production in the organism, it splices together different subjectively active systems within us that could be mind and heart and body, could be left and right brain, could be our masculine and our feminine, all that kind of stuff. And that by integrating these things in the right way, it produces a surplus, produces a coherence that goes beyond the parts, which we then experience through various lenses as an energy, as a sensation, as a different self, as a transcendental other, there's different ways for our brain to language that to us. But that, um, the extra, the surplus coherence is, is interpreted and projected. And then one of the ways it can be projected is by encountering the whole world or parts of the world in a super salient manner, where it's got this extra organization, this extra meaningfulness, which is sort of the perceptual projection of this extra that we created. And so for me, the both and thinking has a very almost mechanical function of, of bringing multiple systems together in some kind of synchronizing fashion. So how does that, all that does that sound like uh, it's in the ballpark of your definition? To be honest with you, I think you can probably explain my definition better than I can at this moment in time. Um, and it also does sound like it is in the ballpark. And that was a very interesting thing, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not going to not say. I'm no longer in a group um, at the moment. But I did pose a question of what it meant to a lot of people. And I had this thing in my mind that, it, yeah, as you, as you say, it's, the, it's, in, it's getting us to have a better relationship with, with with, ex with existence and therefore with each other and therefore with ourselves and seeing the similarities and the both hands touches between them. And I asked, before I said what I thought it was, I asked everybody and 
what I could see, what everyone was bringing, it was that to degrees, to different degrees, but and to, about different things. Um, but everybody kind of had this same thought that we were, we're trying to we're trying to bring things together and then go beyond them as well. And I found that imp- I found that interesting and important because I think exercises like that are very valuable. The I wish I could remember if I wrote the definition that I wrote down, but I can't. Um, because for me, it did. It, it, I think someone even kind of criticised it that it was kind of general enough to include everybody. But what does that do? And I think this is, I think this is really important for us to do. If if we get a group together and we all give our definition of what the thing is, and then we see where what is similar about our definitions, and then we build from there, then we can we can at least you know move with some understanding of what we're talking about um, and not talk across each other. Yeah, uh, Jason Storm in his recent book talks about that as well, about how we need to think about definitions again um, as processes, um, as processes that are anchored by by other processes, perhaps, and that these what we're given a definition of doesn't have to be strict, um, has to be vague enough to be able to apply to the vast categories, but is specific enough so that you know exactly what you're talking about and you know what it is. Um, yeah, and I, yeah. So I think it's. I think modern. I think it was good when it had a cultural code and a structure of feeling. Uh, I think this is good because it was really vague, but it meant that we could all agree. The trouble is that the cultural code got uh, got this, you know, kind of chucked aside. The cultural code is dialectal thinking. And this, for me, the structure of feeling is the integration of cognitive dissonance because that, that releases tension. And so that brings a feeling that's closer to joy than, than stress. Um, and I think that's, that's basically what we want to do with this modern project. You know, we've, we've got this thing that we've done. We've got this modern, modern growth and it's gone wrong somehow. We don't know how. So we apply it to itself. And then it's like, oh, hold on a second. This is making things worse. And then we're like, okay, well, let's try, let's try this version. And it's like, no, no, no. Okay, that's not working. Let's try this version here. It's like, okay, let's try, you know, oscillate. Let's try this version here and this version here. And we just oscillate back and forth between these things that don't work. And um, it just causes tension and tension. And then once you're free of that, it's like, oh. And it's, yeah, so um, for me, that's, that's all metamodernism is. And every, everything is an attempt to do that. If you look in the lit- literature, Zava Dan, he was talking about metafiction and uh, the non-fictional novel in response to life just being so absurd that it's basically a fiction anyway. That's just an attempt to, to, to be like, oh, you know? Um, yeah, I think the trouble that some people see with this is that point of view is that, so I'm going on a bit and I'll be quick. Uh, the trouble some people see with that point of view is that it makes it so general that you can see metamodernism, metamodernism popping up everywhere, modernism popping up everywhere, and postmodernism popping up everywhere and hypermodernism popping up everywhere. And I think that that's for a reason. This way of something, the opposite, the both, the both really quickly until something new, the opposite, the both, you know, and it's, that's, yeah. I personally call it emanation. I don't call it emergence, I call it emanation because for me, emergence has scarcity-based connotations. Um, There's an emergency, there's an urgency, and also uh, merge, it it's, it's also has the transcendent to it as well, which I think we need to go beyond with uh, metamodernism. And um, the transcendent is opposite to the imminent. So if something emerges, it comes out of. So it, it's no longer merged with that thing, it's come out, so it's emerged from that thing. Um, f- for me, I think we need to bring together the transcendent and the imminent. I call it eminism. Yeah. And I, th- I think a lot of the problems come from, from that, that quite to me, yeah. Uh, the question of definitions is very interesting to me. Um, you know, it's easy to critique, as Nietzsche did, Socrates having conversations with people and trying to seemingly intellectually define concepts that in Nietzsche's critique missed the fact that they already had a collective instinctive understanding. They were kind of letting go of their instinct by moving to the definition. But there's another way to read Socrates, which is he's kind of like a spiritual figure creating intersubjective illumination events. 
And the way he does that, the way he evokes that collaborative intelligence is by working on a definition to get it, like you said, into that sweet spot where it's vague enough to handle all the things we might be talking about and specific enough that it takes us together to a next level of the feeling of clarity together. And I think metamodernism has that. Like one of the reasons it's attractive is because it's wide open and uh, people go into it because it seems like more open, say, than integral theory or something like that, less specific than game B. Uh, when they get there, they fill it up and they negotiate and then you try to redefine what they all have in common. And it's like for Vakey's notion of this oppositional processing, you're widening it out and you're narrowing it down. And you're continually doing this in order to provide a function for the, the spirit of the thing to emanate, as you would say. And I think there's a lot of, uh, you mentioned jamming, right? I think there's a lot of improvisational skill that we all have to build up. One of the first discussions we had on the integral stage was, uh, me talking to Greg Thomas about improv in jazz and improv in shamanism. Uh, so there's, I, I think, a, a huge connection between the skill set that you need to develop in the yes and model of improv and this sort of both and thinking. Uh, I guess I'm rambling too now. Speaking of shamanism and speaking of journeying, uh, as you mentioned a little while ago, what are your other internal practices? Mm. When I was about 15, my friend, John Owen Williams, uh, introduced me to Taoism. And that set a massive tone. I think I'd, yeah, sorry. One of the reasons why I find it difficult to just give it straightforward is because I'm always making these connections. Um, yeah, from a young age, I noticed there was this space. I noticed there was this thing I can remember noticing. And, no, and yeah, and trying to navigate it. And when he brought me to the Taoism and stuff, it just made a lot of sense. I see Taoism as uh, very, I want to say African, but that's not what I mean. I just mean that they're very similar. There's just some, there's some unity there, perhaps to do with the time of that. Um, yeah, people got there. I've tangented, so I've, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> it was about what your uh, internal practices are. What's your, uh, what are your spiritual or developmental exercises? So one of them is that I know nothing and that I know I know nothing. I find that quite important to remember. And I, I mean, like, you know, I'm, I'm ignorant, but I also mean the meta nothing beyond that, that the meta existence beyond that, the thing that we call God, you know, and, and just saying, you know, I know it, you know, I mean, yeah. Um, that's one of them. I have meditated quite a lot. I've done Qigong, I've done Tai Chi, um, I've done lots of different types of meditations, Kriya, um, Kundalini, uh, lots of different types. Um, the past in there, not once a retreat, but practiced. And I, <laughs> I, get, I guess I'm always trying to wing things and put things together. And I, you know, and I really like the idea of meditating as you do things. So, yeah, just being aware of what I'm doing while I'm doing it. Um, I found that really special i also find that something really special doing groups as well just to just to point out that there's this thing that you know that we all got and well there's a space in the room that we're all holding just you know and it's just seemed to brings a brings a group together really nicely yeah i was raised christian the african diaspora of christianity is slightly different i believe in that we have, just like we used to, you know, cane row and hide rice and maps in our hair, we, and seeds as well, we've kind of hidden African spirituality within Christianity. Um, and I think that's very valuable. And more recently, Ifa has come to my attention uh, in very special ways. Um, Ifa, Ifa is very interesting. It's got things like blood sacrifice, so it's where voodoo comes from. Um, and I try to look at it as, it's not even sacrifice, it's offering. It's an offering. I think it's ebo or ebo, I can't remember. Ebo, ebo, ebo is, it really means offering, not sacrifice. You're making an offering to the Orishas. Orisha, that comes from the same word as ori. So it's like, a, it's like a embodiment of a specific shard of the main source, you know? So, <sighs> What I like about Aoife 
is you can see how it's metatheistic. You can see how it's animist. It's animist in the, in the sense that, you know, the Ori, we're all through this by this Ori and trees and, and, and animals and stones talk in the ether corpus, which is all the text about ether. Um, it's 10,000 years old. That for me is just an amazing thing that something has lasted that long. And instead of being changed or bits taken out, it's been added to. So the proverbs have been added to over time. So now it would take a lifetime to, because Aoife, Aoife priests are meant to learn everything, you know, they're meant to learn all the text and it would take a lifetime to do that. Um, um, that priest is not the right term, forgive me. I can't remember the right term. And um, Babalawo, Babalawo. Yeah, it, 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 it invokes everything. It invokes shamanism because you have the divination, you have the, you know, the divination aspect of it. You have, then you have the, the theistic side of it because you have the Oladomare, which is the one spirit which every spirit comes from. Then you have the, uh, the polytheistic side of it, because you have all these Orishas. Some of these Orishas are actually humans, so a lot like Rastafarian. This is, a lot of people don't understand, you know, why Haile Selassie was deified by Rastas, you know. Oh, you're saying he's actually Jesus? It's, a, it's, a, it's an embodiment. It's an embodiment of an energy, you know. Controversial to uh, the Eritreans, yes. However, it's an embodiment of an energy. So, yeah, for me, and Aoife uh, has also been synthesized with uh, Christianity as well in terms of Santaria, um, where all the Irishas have become uh, saints. Yeah, so I guess Aoife at the moment, it holds a very special place. And the jam that uh, I, I help run and host tonight um, is called Ori Jam, um, which uh, it wasn't set up by me. Um, I've got a friend who's a Babalawo. Um, Crispin, Ade Crispin. He's a Jamaican. He's a, he was born in Jamaica. He's, he's white. He's born in Jamaica. Uh, he's about seven foot and uh, he's a drummer and he has invested time in, into understanding Aoife uh, in a way I'm very appreciative of. And yeah, uh, this, if we're going to get into the irrational, I had a reading from him and in the reading he said, oh, you're going to, you know, this is going to be, Aoife is going to be important in your life. He said, Ether's going to be important in your life. I don't know why, but you, you're going to want to read up on it. And I said, okay. People who are listening to this, how is it spelled? Spelled, oh, I-F-A, I-F-A. Yeah. Um, and and yes, yeah, so that was about, that was about uh, four or five years ago. And last year, my friend asked me to come down to his jam night and help him out. And that was Ori Jam. And then this year, I found, you know, this massive, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's very interesting. I think this is a segue, but I think divination is not understood. This includes tarot reading and runes. I think it's not understood. I think it's dismissed far too easily. I've just read a paper comparing Native American divination and African divination, uh, where native the, the randomness is both used. Native Americans will use randomness of movement throw something and African systems will use deterministic chaos. So um, binary code came from, um, was inspired by African divination. Um, they called it geomancy. Um, it's basically just lines. Two lines is like solid. Uh, uh, one line is not or, or vice versa. And deterministic chaos is like, a, it's when you make a pattern and the pattern produces uh, like a like a random number generator. They're not really random. They just the cycles are so long that it, it, it might as well be random for us. And so, <laughs> when you look into meta existence, it's clear that it's quite chaotic and random and changing. So by using divination divination tools like this, we are accessing that somehow that random creation generator, and then reading the archetype of it. Of what, and then relating it back to how that can help us. Now it might be completely, complete nonsense. It might be complete nonsense. However, I don't think that really matters when we see, if this if it's comes from scarcity thinking, I don't think we can denounce it completely when we see that either all thinking has come from scarcity thinking. So, and this is the thing. So the people who will celebrate analytical thinking will also champion dichotomy um, because of what it has brought, but then, but then 
when we see it comes from scarcity based thinking, it means, okay, now I can't just dismiss anything that comes from that kind of thinking, actually. Um, because you could say that, you know, either all logic isn't really logical because of where it's brought us. And so, you know, um, yeah. Again, rambling. <laughs> That's, uh, it, it's interesting to see some of these uh, overlaps because there was a lot of divination play at the last Metamar and Spirituality Retreat, um, especially thanks to Scout Wiley and Jared Morningstar, who were all in on the decks. But I think it's fascinating to see things like that. You're like, oh, is that a, a broadly shared interest and form of appreciation among people in whatever this emerging or emanating cultural mood is. That's very intriguing. Uh, another similarity, like I grew up in a house, although the background was a little bit, uh, let's say, neo-pagan <laughs> around me. Within the house, uh, Christianity and Taoism, that's what we had. We had a Bible and a Tao Da Ching. Uh, my mom, the way my mom talked about the Bible made it seem to me that there was technical information in the things Jesus was saying. And in the Tao Da Ching, it was always this, this sense of trying to be outside of your labels and outside of your thoughts to be able to interact with them. But also this beautiful passage where, where Lao Tzu, assuming that's a guy, um, says, because no one remembers the ancient sages, I'll tell you what they were like. And it blew my mind as a kid because I thought he was an ancient sage. He's like, no, no, way back there were these people. He said, what was their practice? He says, they were like people who crossed a frozen river and didn't know how thick the ice was. And I thought, wow, that's the mindfulness I want. I want to be in that state. <laughs> uh, but it's intriguing that you know, there's a lot of this interest in divination. There's an interesting blend between us of Taoism and Christianity. I um, wonder, yeah, I don't know. I have no question. I'm just saying things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean... Taoism is special. It is special. Um, yeah, for me anyway. Um, maybe it's just, but um, I guess in the way that it just tears down the light supremacy, whole idea of light supremacy, it's a very good antidote for the for the Bible and the light supremacy that's within the Bible. In the way it was set up, light as good and holy, and the devil as darkness. Um, yeah, I was actually called black like the devil once by one of my neighbours when I was growing up in Gloucester. Um, they're my friends, so you know I forgave them in the end, and I don't think they would think about what they were saying. Which probably sounds crazy to some black people for me to forgive them, but um, yeah, um, and but I understood. I understood it wasn't there. it wasn't them. That stuff doesn't come out of our mouths unless it's been fed into us. And and yeah, so I really liked that. Um, I think this this link between divination and computing. I think there's something I have not explored yet there. Um, yeah. I, I know there are I know there are a lot of metamodernists who are completely the opposite and think we should do away with all of this kind of stuff and that is magical thinking. Um, yeah, I mean I, I agree it's magical thinking. I don't agree we should just do away with it because I don't think we've actually understood it fully yet. Yeah, and there's a, you know, like in the Ken Wilber sense, the pre-trans thing, right? They look yeah. similar because they're both not the conventional. So you think, okay, what's, what's say higher magic as opposed to lower magic? Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to go all in on that because there might be things about what we're thinking of as lower magic that we haven't understood that actually contain a lot more intelligence than we realized. Yeah. I mean, we use computers nowadays a lot to make predictions. <laughs> it's, yeah, it seems to be to come to full circle. Um, and yeah, the pre-trans fallacy, it just comes from believing that they were stupider than us, basically. It, it comes from the, the idea of, you know, less, less than, which is very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's important to be able to make distinctions like that, you know, just because it's not normal, it doesn't tell you whether it's subnormal or better than normal. But that doesn't mean the previous things <laughs> were subnormal. They might have been more than normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no, yeah. No, uh, go on. The uh, you know one of the ways we think about meta modernity is a bit of a response to the meta crisis, right? To this mm -hmm. overwhelming convergence of problems that we're responding to, but I think it's also a response to some of the other massive trends of change in the system. And one of the trends I see a lot is we're 
we're almost technologically realizing our, our ignorance, right? We're, you know, chaos science, complexity science, the vastness of things. Our physics requires dimensions we can't even imagine. Turns out that, you know, most of our thinking is done in parts of the brain that make no sense to us. Most of the computational patterns that could exist wouldn't be recognized by human brains as being patterned at all. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're coming to inhabit a world where the, the complexity that exceeds our ability to compress it is like an outstanding fact. And so I think some of the mood of metamodernity is, well, how do we deal with that then? Do I need the unconscious? Do I need feel? Do I need something I previously dismissed as irrational in order to help me adapt to this obvious world that's coming forward? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, Firstly, I totally agree. Metamodernism is a direct, come directly as a need to address the meta crisis. Which for me, I cannot see a part of the meta crisis which is not there because of either or thinking. I'm, I'm throwing this out there. Someone, come back to me, please, if you can find one and let's see if I can suss it out. But yeah, I think either or thinking is why we're here. We're trapped in it um, with no degrees of freedom. Yeah, but then yeah, there is also, I mean. Uh, people that's why people tend to nihilism isn't it it's because you know oh we're, i'm so small i'm nothing you know compared to the vastness of everything else you know and this comes from either or thinking as well you know it's like well i'm, I'm either everything or i'm nothing um i seem like i'm everything but also i'm definitely nothing you know and it's like and even when even when i look at the everything that i am into this into into my soul into my heart into the space that is in my mind and you know i find a vast cavern i can find a vast cavern of infinite nothingness um i've asked everyone i can but if i go if i travel in my mind you know imagine me I, I can't get to the end um that in itself is intimidating enough to turn away from that in a in a world yeah i guess that contributes to narcissism in a way um so i agree with you uh it's yeah it's, it's uh, med mod modernism got so far it created problems that it could only solve with modernism and yeah, materialism or anti-materialism, you know, transcendence or imminence, you know, and having to go back and forth between these seemingly opposite things with no way of keeping them as a dying into a hole. Um, yeah. At yeah. this point in your life, what's your relationship to Jesus Christ? <laughs> <laughs> and, and like bigger than that what's a diunital christ <laughs> well the only good lord is the good lord jesus uh and that's a that's a that's a quote i actually live in my landlord's home so i, I can't really say that but uh, i so i like to make the definition distinction between a landlord and a homeowner um uh, but that's a that's off topic from my point of view I have to be tricky because my, my family is very Christian. From my point of view, I must see it both as a story and as truth. Um, because I actually just don't know. And I don't think anyone does. Then I have to look at the story and say, okay, does this story help me and which parts help me? And that's the thing about the story of Jesus. It's like it's written all for help. In fact, for uh, the son of an immigrant, uh, it's, <laughs> it's very useful. So, yeah, there's that. Um, and then when I look at, like, the truth of it, or if it is true, I, I can't just look at it from the Christian perspective. This is the thing. I have to look at it also from the Islamic perspective as well. You know, um, Jesus is mentioned in the Quran way more than Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, to have respect. He's way more. So they revere this man. And the only, the only real difference is, is that they don't think he was the son of God and that they think that... Uh, it wasn't him who died on the cross, but he was taken up to heaven and a criminal was put in place. The criminal soul was put in place. He was taken up to heaven and then he was allowed to come back down because of that. I don't, I think there is an issue in Christianity when it comes to Jesus as the son of God, because if I am calling God the father, then what does that make me? And Jesus said, son of man, a lot. So, and while I'm not saying that we're all Jesus, <laughs> I think he was speaking, this is again where we're taking our worldviews, we're taking our, our dichotomous worldviews and we're imposing it on these other people who probably didn't think like we think, you know. Um, so, 
Yeah, uh, yeah. I've got a lot of respect for Christians who aren't evangelical. My stepdad, uh, I want to point out as well, because I know some people think I am racist against white people. My stepdad um, was an English, white English man with blue eyes, um, and he may be the man I am today. So I'm very grateful to him. Um, he passed in 20, he passed in the COVID year. And one of the things I found out after he passed is that he was devoutly Christian. Now, my mum's devoutly Christian as well, and we'll say grace, and we'll hold hands at the table and close our eyes, and, you know, me and my brother will open, and my dad's eyes will be open. He won't be saying no judgment. Um, we never, he used to sometimes go to church. He never told us to go to church. If we didn't go, want to go to church, he'd stay at home with us, you know? But he was a devout Christian, <laughs> and it's because uh, he, he went to Papua New Guinea to study for a while, and he found missionaries there. He found what missionaries had done there, and, and, and the, the way they had, the way that they had, desecrated culture by imposing things on people and imposing in a downward fashion not on a peer-to-peer -peer fashion and so that made him just stick stay away from evangelicizing christianity at all or putting in anything i've never heard him say the word jesus you know what i'm saying so it's like and i value that because while i you know i, I respect one of the uh jehovah's witnesses on the side of the road, you know, I say thank you. I say God bless you because that's really what they want to hear. Really, they, you know, they want they want to be ignored. At the same time, if it, you know people who push it onto me, then I'm probably going to have a conversation with you to challenge some of your beliefs. You know, especially if you're pushing it in a way which is like you are doing devilish things right now, and it's like okay, what's the devil? You know, how, what how you know who created the world? Who created everything in existence? So who created the devil? So why would that happen? So the devil's completely bad, but was created by God. And God knows what the devil, okay, so tell me more about that, you know? And just, and, and how, how do you relate with the devil, what, you know, within you and stuff like that? And um, yeah, uh, I once, oh, sorry, <laughs> again, tangent. I once did this with a, Mus a Muslim cleric who was on the street, you know, and, and he was saying, you know, this is the word of God. This is perfect. Well, I said, bro, it's not perfect. It can't be perfect. Because even in the Quran, it says that only God is perfect, you know? Nothing in God's creation you do not worship. It's not perfect. Humans are not perfect. Muhammad, peace be upon him, could not be perfect. Could not be by this reasoning. And so therefore the Quran, while it is the transmitter of this perfection, it cannot be itself perfect. And so there are some bits we have to interpret in ways where we, we think, you know, that this is challenging the perfection for us. After a bit of talking, he was like, oh, no, no, actually, do you know what, brother? You're, you know, I can see what you're saying. You're not disrespecting. You're, you're actually having complete respect for the text. And every time I see him, he's, he's cool. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I think evangelicizing, unless you're willing to have that good faith argument as a Christian or uh, as anything, as a metamodernist, you know, unless you're willing to have, be criticized and to understand where the other person's coming from and willing to say, yo, actually, I might be wrong about this and admit it and say, and, and thank the other person, you know, um, I think it's, a, yeah, that's really important. Um, yeah, you'll see two boxers hugging at the end of the thing. And that's because there's this thing that you go through when you have an intense clash with someone. You know, there's a respect that you build up uh, for each other. And yeah, um, conflict is not necessarily negative. <laughs> this, um, I mean, there's the mood of both and permeates this whole discussion. I love it. Like there's the person who's very Christian, but you never find that out about them. And there's the... Uh, way in which challenging somebody is actually a, a deepening and a way of being on the same side as them. And there's all these, like my favorite Christianities are the ones that do that move. Like I always loved Kierkegaard. It's like, you know, faith is the opposite of reason. And he, I'm a Christian because it's the least reasonable possible thing, because it simply can't be the case that someone was historical and ahistorical, was human and divine. It doesn't make sense at all. It's utterly impossible. That's why I believe it, because those are the only things you can believe in. Otherwise, they're just facts. And you're like, hmm, I can appreciate that take. Just like it's really interesting to me, like all of the good and bad things about Christianity, <laughs> All of the horrors and massacres, but also the transformations and the, you know, experiences of Jesus. E even if there was no historical Jesus, that stuff all still holds, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, wow, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this kind of double experience. Mm -hmm. 
I think we're building a community of people capable of that double experience in their thinking and in their feeling. And they're, they're trying to work out, you know, what is it we generally have in common? What could we do collectively? And is this an adaptation or a capacity that might be able to help the world out in, in what it's going through now and about to go through? And I also want to add that uh, my mum was uh, my mum's church back in Jamaica was Moravian, uh, Moravian church um, up in the hills of Jamaica, and they have a very interesting motto which I think can help us uh, navigate all of these you know being challenged by the people and and, and, and they say uh, in essentials unity, non essentials liberty, and in all things love. So. It's why I welcome the combative <laughs> into my forums. As long as you know you, you be respectful of people, you need to challenge people, and um, because actually we need these, we need unity in these essential things. And the only way we can get that unity is by discovering where we differ in those essential world views and what I think the unity is that these essentials are. And um, uh, in, in terms of not, not in terms of the epistemology, but in terms of okay, everyone wants their children to be you know happy. We want a seven generations. We want humans to last at least that long. Um, yeah, so I think that it just points away, you know. And then in non-essentials, liberty. So, okay, if it's not actually essential, you're free to think what you want to think, you know. As long as we're not being racist or sexist or as long as having respect for people, that's essential. You know, you can, you can have your different epistemology as long as it's not going to, you know, impact any of the essentials that we are going to, yeah. And I think that's where it's seeing where these essentials sometimes impact the essentials and vice versa. It can be tricky, um, and then we, we can forget that in all things is love because we're intensely defending ourselves. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, that's a terrific moral message. I'm going to turn the recording off there. <laughs> <laughs>